Well, my channel's been around for a while now. I've got well over 500 videos, and I'm pretty sure this is my first martial arts book review, which is crazy. Although I should point out, it's martial arts tangential. And this is Ben Miller's Methods of Using the Club for Self-Defense and Exercise in 19th Century Germany. And it's a great little book. Uh, I say little, it's 110 pages and has a fair amount of historic illustrations. So, you know, it makes sense. Uh, I love kind of narrow focus books like this. Overlooked subject, deep dive, maybe for the first time. And, you know, you don't need 300 pages to cover that exact subject that I read for you vis-a-vis -vis the title. Love this image here, and it's a clue to the fact that the book is a lot about the old-school physical culture, gymnasium-type training, Victorian-era exercise that's kind of been experiencing a slow and steady comeback over the years. Here is the author's bio. I'm not going to read it, but he's a historical fencing expert and has written books in that space. And that's his specialty, but as you might have seen in that list up above, uh, basically he's what we would today term a HEMA researcher and writer. But anyway, let's talk about clubs. They've been around for a long time. Here's the Bayo or Bayou tapestry, and our man here in the center seems to be holding one. Our Germanic warrior here, who's helping to guard the Emperor Trajan, is armed, as you can see, with a shield and wooden club. Over in the New World, our ancient Kolima warrior here seems to be armed with a large two-handed club of some kind. Also sticking to the Americas, here's some thumbnails from videos from my channel showing North American, Native American, ball-headed wooden clubs. And those are highly carved, but it's still a, you know, asymmetrical, top-heavy, all-wood bludgeon. Speaking of the Americas, also from my channel, Penobscot, a root club, and the bottom line is pretty simple to see, right? So obviously this has been a battle expedient since prehistory. But the dichotomy is that despite that, in a way, all wooden, bulbous striking implements, so not symmetrical or mostly symmetrical batons or staves or anything like that, are at the same time kind of a rarity. Believe it or not. And why? Well, because of things like this. We're looking at a Mesopotamian stone head for a mace. So it was a long, long time ago that people realized fashioning something that has a stone striking load on the top of your wooden shaft is far superior. And this happened all over the world. Here's some ancient Chinese stone mace heads. And as you might have seen in that text at the start, we're talking about thousands of years before the birth of Christ. Or as you can see here, this is obviously from the same academic paper, by the way, uh, from the region of Turkey, a stone mace head goes back to about 10,000 years before Christ, so a good 12,000 years old. Here's one from Costa Rica. So yeah, all you need is a stone age technology. Obviously, I remember seeing a army, you know, field guide survival manual type booklet at some point in my life, and... If you were in the woods, completely unarmed, and needed to arm yourself, it recommended making what I'm talking about here. Basically, you take a stone, a stick, and somehow attach the two. Here are some star-shaped striking heads, very typical of the Inca Empire. Stone, and then they were later replaced with metal. As you'll see at the top right, which uh, with another thumbnail from one of my videos. But regardless, you get my point. And I think this is an overlooked point. Again, it's an interesting dichotomy. The like caveman-like cliched wooden club. Again, the asymmetrical bulbous type broke off a branch and maybe shaved off the top a little bit or rounded it out kind of club is both ubiquitous throughout history and not as common as we tend to think. And remember, the book we're talking about today is focused on the 19th century, 19th century Germany. Well, men in the 19th century had swords to defend themselves with or duel with. And they, of course, had guns. Knives, of course. Bowie knives were real popular back then, not just in the United States. Oh, hell, the very last video I released on my channel was a gentleman's kind of civilian self-defense implement. 
So why was there enough activity around the wooden club in Germany in the 1800s? Well, I'm not going to give it all away, but the book gets into that, and it has to do with good old-fashioned exercise. Here's Pat Militage, one of the most important coaches in the history of MMA, who is, as you can see here, a big fan of what are called Indian clubs. So he trains MMA fighters. He's using this here for exercise, not for martial arts. And this, of course, has a rich, deep history in India and Persia. And a lot of you probably know this be this kind of thing, not just this thing, but this kind of exercise became all the rage during the 19th century, the Victorian era, and that kind of thing has been experiencing a slow and steady resurgence in popularity. Now, the story is not as simple as I am making it out to be. That's, you know, those details are in the book. It's not as uh, simple as, oh, Indian clubs became popular, and therefore that's why in Germany they started exercising and kind of pseudo-fencing with clubs. A real quick mention along these lines, this is Ben's YouTube channel, Physical Culture Historians, which deals with that side of things. So, like I said, it was really the confluence of the weaponry side and the exercise, and let's say, you know, fad, but maybe not necessarily in a bad way, confluence of those two that equaled the phenomenon that the book focuses on. And it involves different national systems of exercise, kind of dueling methodologies, and how the particular treaties and methodology that this book resurrects, translates, and, and surfaces came to be. Even though the book is only of the length that I mentioned, uh, it does something very near and dear to my heart, which is that it covers an extremely wide swath of time. It sets the historical context by going way, way back to the, you know, almost like the primordial appeal of the club and its representations. So let's get into the book and you'll see a little bit of that. Open this puppy up and yeah, the preliminary pages. Uh, boy, those take more work than you might think when you write a book. It's so annoying. Uh, table of contents. Uh, the introduction goes up to page 47. It's really like the overall background, historical background that I was talking about. So it, it jumps uh, across thousands of years. I talked earlier about cool historical illustrations. I'm always down for seeing those old representations of weapons, whether or not they're accurate, trying to decipher that stuff. Some sculpture, as you saw. And yeah, this is a classic trope, the strong man with his club. And I was excited to see the wild man archetype touched on, too. And that's got some cool uh, folkloric mythological tie-ins. And then you jump all the way to modernity, and it's interesting that people were exercising with this most ancient of weapons. Here, by the way, Hugo Rothstein, who's treatise is the one that the book is based on. And so you get the full text of that in English and German, and the kind of nifty old illustrations that you'd expect in this kind of manual. But again, this was more exercise-centered than martial arts focused. So, yeah, great little book, like I said. I love thorough deep dives on obscure parts of martial arts and or physical culture history. By the way, these two pages came in very handy for me because I was in the process of editing my next book, my weapons book, and uh, this gave me something to add in, but I don't want to say what. I don't want to give it away. And there it is, my review. Thanks for watching.